Hello, the internet. Welcome to Open Source Directions, hosted by Quantsight, the webinar that brings you all of the news about your favorite open source projects. My name is Anthony Sco Scopatz, your host for Open Source Directions, and co-hosting with, co with me today for the first time is Carol. Carol, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, folks. I'm Carol Winling. I'm an active member of the Jupyter and Python communities, and I am very happy to have the opportunity to uh, co-host my first podcast here with Anthony and to talk with Stan about Numba. Yeah, we're we're really happy to have you. You'll be a recurring co-host here, and uh, it's great to have you on board. Uh, mm -hmm. Stan, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Yep. Hi, I'm Stan Siebert. Uh, I uh, work here at uh, Anaconda. Um, I do lots of things at Anaconda, but for the purposes of this podcast, I am a Numba developer. That's the hat I'm currently wearing. Well, not really, but um, yeah, I'm excited <laughs> to talk about Numba. <laughs> Excellent. Well, welcome. This week, we have our famous Tweet of the Week section, where each of our panelists gets to present a tweet that they've been enjoying recently. So, Stan, I believe you have a tweet up for uh, for us. Yeah, do you need me to put it up on the screen here? or? Uh... Uh, no, you can just go ahead and, and read it. And, oh, cool. uh, oh, awesome. And, and so I'm, not going, I'm not going to attempt to uh, read it in the Spanish, uh, although I did take Spanish in high school. But translated, uh, this is a great tweet. Uh, Visualizing strange attractors with 10 million points in data shader. Cool. And uh, this, <laughs> the reason I like this tweet is uh, a couple months ago, the uh, data shader developers uh, put an example of how to visualize a strange attractor using Numba to do the compute and then plot a whole bunch of points using data shader. And after that went up, I started trying to figure out why I was constantly seeing all these cool pictures in the Numba Twitter feed. Uh, and that's so like everyone goes in and they try different color schemes. It's awesome. So uh, I always like cool pictures. So, uh, <laughs> Feel free to post your, your best picture you ever made with Numba, and uh, we'll probably retweet it. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Carol? Nice. Uh, this one, Stan, is in honor of some of the things that you do, and I'll let you chat about it later. But I have a tweet that's from We Robotics that is doing their We Robotics Global um, Conference, and they're grateful to have the Rockefeller Foundation as a donor. Uh, and a host for their conference. And they basically use robotics for using, uh, doing social good. So I would say check them out as an organization as well as there's some great tweets coming out today about them as, as well. Excellent. For my part, Francesco Ted tweets this week, very happy to announce that the BLOSS project just entered the NumFocus Foundation as a sponsored project. Um, so. Three cheers to uh, to Blosk, and there's more details cool. in the tweet that you can read about the roadmap for Blosk too. So, very exciting there. At this point, we're going to go ahead and introduce Numba. So, we're going to have just a brief little question and answer section with Stan here. So, Numba, if you're not otherwise aware, is a collection of just-in-time compilers for numerical Python, and it translates Python functions on the fly into high-performance machine code. Uh, without a separate compilation step that you have to do ahead of time. And you don't need a C compiler, et cetera. So it supports a wide range of chips for both CPUs and GPUs and can achieve speed ups on your Python code of between 2x to 200x, depending on kind of what you're doing. It's currently got about 3,800 stars on GitHub and around 625,000 downloads a month across both PyPI and Conda. So it's a very popular project that that's been around for many years now at this point. So yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a lot of downloads for an open source project, which is awesome. So it's great to see. So Stan, why was the project started and what need does it fill? Yeah, so Numba was created to um, make it easier for Python developers to get access. We're getting all this hardware these days that has, you know, lots of cores, vector instructions, GPUs, other things, TPUs, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and it's been hard from Python to take advantage of all that really fast hardware. Uh, and so the goal of Numba is to really try and make that more accessible to uh, to Python developers, both if you're working on your own application or if you're making libraries for the community. Um, we want to reduce the gap there so that you can more easily uh, use that fast hardware without having to leave Python and go write another language or that sort of thing. Excellent. And are there alternative projects out there to Numba? What, what's, what else is available? Yeah, yeah so this is uh, you know, the, the, uh, the landscape of um, 
Python compilers is vast, <laughs> both with <laughs> with functional and uh, derelict projects, because um, it's a really hard problem. Compiling Python, Python was not designed to make compilation easy. Uh, and so there's a lot of different, basically it's all about trade-offs. The reason so many of these projects exist and so many of them are valuable. I, uh, one thing I never tried to get into is the you know Numba versus the world kind of thing, because they all approach the problem differently because they're making different trade-offs that may work for some problems and not others. Uh, and the main splitting point that you see in, in sort of how you do Python compilation is the, do you work inside of the Python interpreter? So C Python is usually what people call it because um, there are a couple of Python interpreters out there. The main one that you get from python.org is called CPython usually. Um, do you work inside of CPython or do you replace CPython? And if you work inside of CPython, uh, then you're, this is like what Numba does, but you're also think, talking about things like Cython, which will let you take, uh, they extend the Python syntax to let you specify C types for things like this is an int and this is a float. Uh, and then it will generate C code or C++ code that you then compile ahead of time. Um, there are other projects uh, like uh, Theano and Pythran that do similar things for numerical Python. Um, you could argue that NumExpr is kind of a uh, special purpose <laughs> array uh, expression compiler. Um, it compiles to kind of like a little mini virtual machine. Um, and projects like PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow are adding this kind of array specific uh, compilation. Um, if you get to the the other the other branch of that decision tree, uh, you're talking about something that replaces the whole CPython interpreter with something that's more compiler friendly. Um, mm -hmm. So the big the big project here is PyPy, uh, which has been around for more than ten years now, and it is effectively uh, you could do an entire episode on PyPy. By the way, PyPy is amazing. Uh, but PyPy, the short version is uh, is what you would call a tracing JIT. So it runs your code, watches how it runs, what types propagate through your code, and then when it sees hot spots that it can uh, optimize, it will recompile that chunk into a faster bit of machine code. This is what your JavaScript uh, interpreter does in, in modern web browsers and why the web is uh, as fast as it is with complicated JavaScript. Um, other projects that do uh, a, a bit of, uh, I would say, sort of interpreter replacement are things like uh, Nuitka and Shedskin, which will take your application and statically translate it to C++ that you can compile and make just a standalone binary that runs your whole thing. It still usually links to libpython for some of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, and there are also other replacement uh, interpreters like Piston and, and Pigeon, um, and even before that, Unladen Swallow. Um, all of those projects are uh, uh, mostly on, uh, on hiatus at this point. Um, it's, it is, I, I can't emphasize enough, it's such a hard problem that a lot of people will make the attempt and then the project will, will be abandoned. So um, I am excited that Numba is still alive <laughs> because <laughs> there are a lot of things that could have gone off the rails. Um, and the thing I, I mentioned there is that those are all CPU projects. There's also the whole GPU space that Numba also operates in. Uh, and those are there are also fewer projects for Python to GPU because it just feels like such a uh, I talk to a lot of people who are like, why would I combine the Python interpreter with a uh, super high performance parallel GPU? And that's actually not crazy. Uh, there, so there are things like uh, Tiano to do this. And you could argue a lot of the deep learning frameworks effectively do this as well. Yeah, it's a pretty exciting space, Dan. And I think um, I really like how you framed it with it's a matter of what trade offs you make. Um, yep. in terms of what you get back. And so I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what technology Numba is built on. Yeah, so uh, just a little bit of sort of compiler, you know, theory here to keep it simple. Um, most compilers come in sort of, uh, yeah, yeah I know. Some, some simple compiler but, theory, it's 9 a.m. Yeah. on the West hey, Coast. <laughs> you know, we're, we're trying to expand your mind here. So um, uh, one way you can look at a compiler is it really comes in two pieces. Um, actual compiler people are probably going to be crying right now, but you can think of a, a compiler as two pieces, a front end and a back end. The front end is uh, looks at the actual language the programmer is writing, so like Python, or actually Numba works on the Python bytecode as it happens, but it, it takes some kind of input, uh, and then is responsible for taking that and understanding the semantics. What did you actually mean when you wrote that? Uh, and translates it to some kind of intermediate representation that's easier to manipulate, to do optimizations to, to do all kinds of things. That's that's sort of the job of the front end. And then the job of the back end is to take that intermediate representation and apply standard optimization passes that decades of compiler theory have come up with, and then finally translate down to the actual machine code of the target, whether that's uh, you know an Intel CPU or a, a GPU or whatever, um, the actual machine, pick the best machine instructions to do the thing 
that you're trying to do. Um, and so the nice part about Numba is that the back end we didn't have to write. So LLVM is a, uh, a now a very prominent open source project, started as a research project to make a more modular compiler and was so successful, it's now the basis of uh, Clang, which is a C and C++ compiler that is sort of standard on Apple machines, but you can use it on Linux and Windows as well. Um, the Swift language that uh, Apple created is also based on LLVM. Uh, lots of companies use uh, internal copies, forks of LLVM basically to do different special purpose compilers. It's extremely flexible. And it, so it means that we didn't need a room full of compiler engineers to make Numba. We could do it with sort of two to four people to just worry about that Python front end translate it down, and then let LLVM do the rest in the back. Um, as a nice side bonus, uh, all the GPU compilers are now also based on LLVM, both from NVIDIA and AMD. So we didn't have to do, we could share a lot of code that we have between our CPU and GPU targets. Um, they're not identical, but they are close enough that we don't have to start from scratch. Oh yeah, that that's very nice actually. So who started the Numba project? Yeah, so the, the Numba history is uh, long and uh, complicated. Um, so the very first version of Numba, you could argue actually there's like been three Numbas. <laughs> um, it's, it's uh, you know, that thing I was talking about how the project, you know, a lot of these projects end. Numba didn't really end, but it kind of went through uh, major metamorphoses at sort of two times in its life. So the initial version of Numba was written by Travis Oliphant, actually, um, as a prototype to kind of get people excited about how cool LLVM was. Uh, and quickly, John Real joined. Uh, this is the old sort of continuum analytics um, that turned into Anaconda. Uh, John Real joined, and then shortly after that, um, Mark Florison and Suquan Lam joined. Uh, and when when they two, when they joined is really when this prototype that Travis made evolved into the second generation of Numba, uh, and that continued until about early 2014. In parallel to that, actually, Sue was working on a GPU-only compiler called Numba Pro, um, and then at early 2014. Uh, it was decided to fuse those code bases, open source Numba Pro, turn it into the basis of Numba so the GPU and the CPU compiler were combined. And that I really is the third and current generation of Numba. And Sue is, is the, still the lead developer uh, to this day. Um, he's about 50 feet that way. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how Numba got to where it is now, seven years later. Oh my gosh, that's a great history stand. So if we're looking at the project today, Who's sort of the key people maintaining the project? Yeah, so there's there's five core developers on Numba now. So there is uh, Suquan Lam, who I mentioned, uh, Stuart Archibald, based in the UK, who's in the chat, and uh, and then myself. And we're the three people at Anaconda. Actually, we just hired someone starting literally like today, uh, who uh, Valentin uh, Hanel, who uh, who's actually involved with Blast and other things in the past. Uh, majority of his, uh, his his duties here at Anaconda will be working on Numba as well. So we're, we're growing the team here. Um, we have two uh, 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 core contributors from Intel. Uh, a couple of years back, Intel contributed a really key piece of Numba. Uh, so Isan Tatoni and uh, Todd Anderson at Intel are now core contributors as well. Um, and then uh, beyond that core team, uh, we do really rapid releases, at least we think they're rapid. Um, so every every six to eight weeks, we're doing another release to try and get stuff out to people quickly. Uh, and in any one of those development cycles, we have about eight to 10 external contributors. That's awesome. That's a good cadence too. Yeah, that's excellent. So that being said, where are your users and contributors coming from? Yeah, so I, I would say our, our early adopters have been uh, a lot in the scientific community and a lot in uh, finance. Um, the scientific community we tend to hear more about, and the finance people maybe don't talk to us as much. <laughs> we, <laughs> we sort of learn about what they're doing indirectly because they're a secretive bunch. But uh, the scientific research stuff has been amazing. Um, uh, my favorite project uh, that uses Numpa is uh, Librosa, which is a uh, package for music and audio analysis, um, which also would make a great podcast, by the way. So <laughs> just just putting that out there. <laughs> Uh, so Librosa uses Numba to be able to take, they have a bunch of music and audio processing algorithms that are really a uh, natural fit for Numba. And so they were one of our early adopters. Um, we've also, there's a, a number of physics simulations that have come along. Uh, there's one project that fell off the map way back in the day that we were, it was simulating kite propulsion for ships. Mm. Uh, it was just, it was a, a weird project showed up, uh, was asking Numba questions. It was kind of cool. Um, but we've got, you know, economics modeling, um, recent, uh, actually recent results uh, for um, dark matter searches and xenon uh, use Numba. 
Um, Intel is working on a, a, what I would call a pandas compiler, basically, that's based on Numba. Um, and we have, uh, and I mentioned data shader during the, the earlier part of the podcast of uh, that internally uses Numba to accelerate all of the uh, rendering of all of these points before you uh, ship them to the browser. So that's the main sort of number contributor. Uh, our users and contributors really seem to come from scientific research and a bit of finance. Um, interestingly, so part of number is uh, is a Python binding to LVM called LVM Lite. Uh, we care enough about LVM, we maintain our own bindings to it because the, we needed some control over that uh, Python interface to make it work for what we needed. Um, we've seen a number of people just come in through that door. They don't care about Numba or Python. They just actually, like compiling Python, they just want to use LVM and are doing some compiler projects. And so they use LLVM like directly. Some security researchers doing things I don't entirely understand will pop up. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, one, there's one group sure. that uses uh, LLVM Lite as I think the basis for a compiler that translates uh, descriptions of like atomic physics experiments. Like you have a bunch of hardware and you have some control logic of what to turn on when. Uh, oh, they I have see. a compiler that translates that using LLVM Lite in some fashion. And so um, they've contributed a lot to LLVM Lite and, and generally don't seem to care about number. So uh, it's kind of interesting. We have these sort of two groups that one is like sort of the compiler people and one is the sort of Python scientific researcher. Sounds yeah. like a good combination, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit because um, my intro to Numbo is actually a, a tutorial at SciPy that Professor mm -hmm. Lorena Barba did with Gil Forsyth. And I'm wondering what Numbo is doing because it is a pretty complicated project um, mm -hmm. to sort of increase participation or any diversity and inclusion efforts. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And by the way, I would suggest that people go check out Lorena's tutorial. That is, we were so I can't explain how excited we were to see that because it was someone besides us who got it. <laughs> it it's excellent. It really is excellent. It's, it's a it's a and, it, and really speaks to the user base we, the, that we wanted to uh, address. So well, um, that tutorial was amazing. Yeah, we'll um, put a link to that in the show notes for sure. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. I, I still send people that link as, as some of the best things to go look at. Um, but yeah, but to your point about diversity and inclusion, um, we've identified as sort of the very first thing, the, even before the first thing we can do, uh, is to make it easier for people to learn how to contribute to Numba. Numba, as you mentioned, is, is really complicated. And over that long lifespan, the internals uh, are kind of like an old growth tree with a lot of uh, rings and uh, uh, places and things that are kind of confusing. And so one of the things we've been focusing on is, the last year, and especially uh, actually coming up right now, um, as we try and onboard more people, is how to make Numba more approachable for a new contributor. Uh, and so our user docs have a lot of stuff, but our developer docs are not as complete. And so um, we're looking to rewrite them. Um, I'm starting that actually review now as it happens uh, to try and make it easier to mentor people because uh, that's the we're really eager to mentor new Numba contributors, but it's not. Uh, it's not helpful or fair for those people if they would just sort of throw the code base at them and say, look, figure it out. Um, no one can do that. So, <laughs> right. so we and really I, need to do a better job at that. Yeah, and I think you guys have done an amazing job. Like to use Numba is actually very straightforward and, and extremely well documented. So I think that's a great direction to go in. And you know how much I love writing documentation. So uh, <laughs> definitely ping me when you get further along. Yeah, so. that's a that's uh, that's a yeah, that's a big focus for us. So that's great. All right, go off of it, Stan. Yeah, and, let's uh, do a little bit of demo here. Yeah, so, let's dive into demoing it. demoing number is always a little bit tricky because it's never, uh, you know, it's like here's the thing and here's the thing faster. It's the same thing. <laughs> there's not there's not a whole lot to see, um, but. You don't have any here. really uh, attractive uh, scaling graphs or anything. So. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> is it just want to check my screen visible? Yep. yep. Yeah. Everything's okay, cool. So, the, the first thing I wanted to show people is uh, the Numba homepage um, has a try Numba button on it, which will take you to Binder uh, to run all of the notebooks I'm about to show you. I'm actually running them locally um, because I have a little bit more CPU power on my laptop than Binder does. Uh, but you can run them all. You may not see all of the performance improvements, um, but you can at least try the code out. So uh, the first notebook in that uh, set I want to show is just sort of showing the number basics. And really, um, this is the key for people to see, is that 
Our goal with Numba is to be as minimally intrusive on your application as possible. So the core interface for Numba, if you will, is really this decorator. We have a couple of decorators, but this one is, is the main one. This is the JIT decorator. Uh, and here I've set no Python equals to true. And really what that's doing is indicating to the compiler, we have, Numba has two modes um, for historical reasons and I'll, stuff I won't get into. Really, if you want to get high performance, what you want Numba to do is to take your function and get rid of all of the Python objects. That's really what no Python means, is it means no <laughs> Python objects. It's all like actual just machine representations of the data, like a literal int, 32 bit int in memory or that kind of thing, not a Python integer. So what this does is basically tells the compiler, okay, if you can't do that, if you can't get rid of all the Python objects, I want you to raise an error so that I know this isn't going to be fast. Um, and so here, this is a kind of a nonsensical function that happens to fit on the screen where I take in an umpy array and I'm going to compute the hyperbolic tangent along its trace. It's uh, not really something you would probably do too often mathematically, but it shows you all the keys that you're writing actual Python. I have a for loop, I'm for looping over a range. Uh, I'm using numpy math functions uh, and I'm doing some kind of accumulation of returning this thing. And so all I had to do, oops, first all you have to do is import number. <laughs> then, then, the, then you can use Numba. So step one is import Numba. Step, now, at this point, nothing's happened yet. Uh, it's the just-in-time compiler aspect is means we don't compile your code until you call it. Because part of what we're doing is seeing what you're actually going to pass in here. Uh, we don't know that you're going to pass in a NumPy array of floats or ints or whatever. So we wait until we, that comes in to make the decision of how to specialize this function. And if you call this function with different kinds of data, we will generate a specialized version for each of those kinds of data. Um, that's really key. And that's one of the things that a JIT can do for you that's very hard to do in ahead of time compilation. NumPy has all of these macros to basically generate all the possible versions of cosine that you might want to call uh, ahead of time in order to make that work. But we can just wait until you until you call the function to do something. So here I'm gonna make this, this is gonna be a float64 array and call the function. And you'll notice there was a bit of a pause there. I mean, I've come through on the, on the podcast webinar thing, but um, that was because we were actually compiling the function, uh, which does take some time. But the next time we call it, it returns much more quickly. Uh, and if we actually time it, uh, we'll see here, because it runs. So just, just a quick yeah. question here. So how how deep do these optimizations go? For like for instance, are you swapping out the NumPy hyperbolic tangent function with the thing in the in libmath or libm rather, yeah. or yeah. loss or, you know, for, for the other various uh, yeah, linear algebra so, functions. Yeah. So what this is basically doing in here is it's going to actually, when you go into the function, we, there's a process called unboxing, where we basically take the data out of the Python object. And that way we can operate on it directly. It also means, by the way, that we can release the gill. Uh, if you put mm -hmm. no gill equals true, uh, at, that, at this point, this function can run concurrently with another function in a different Python thread. Um, and that's because we got rid of all the Python objects. So there's no more of that gill contention to, to worry about. So what we've done is like here, we've pulled out the pointer to the data so that we can actually see the individual double, the, the float 64 is in memory. Uh, and then we're actually gonna call down to lib, the, the libm ta uh, hyperbolic tangent function uh, in order to do the work. Or sometimes we have to implement some of these algorithms internally because there isn't an equivalent uh, math library function available to us, but we're not calling sure. NumPy. That's the main key here is NumPy is not being called. We're just using this as the, this is how you tell us what you meant. Is you're like, oh, I want to use the thing that look, works like the NumPy hyperbolic tangent function. So we'll go do that for you, but maybe not in the same way that you would have if you use NumPy. Right, it's, a, it's effectively a symbolic representation of that. Yeah, we're, we're using NumPy as the interface, not the implementation. Right. right. Uh, so, so that you know that was great. That went fast. Um, and we can also time internally this this compiled function, which works just like a normal Python function from your perspective, has some extra attributes on it, including the original uncompiled Python function is hanging out there. So we can call it too, um, and see that it is yeah that's thirty six microseconds versus two for Numba. So that's this is a bit of a contrived example, but that gives you the idea of what we're trying to do. If you are uh, writing a for loop or something like that, and or you need a for loop, uh, it's going to go enormously faster in Numba than it will in pure Python, just because we avoid all of that interpreter overhead, uh, interpreting every instruction. Um, you could also, of course, anyone who's familiar with NumPy would look at that function and say, that's not idiomatic NumPy. You wouldn't write that for loop, you would just do this. Um, 
And so we can do that and time that out uh, and see that that's still actually not that fast. Um, and the reason for that part, uh, that actually, that's even, that should have been a little faster. I'm a little surprised here. Uh, the main issue here is that NumPy still has to make a bunch of um, temporary arrays. When you call diagonal, you get a new NumPy array. Uh, when you call the hyperbolic tangent, you get another new NumPy array. And then when you add A to it, you get yet another NumPy array. So this, uh, all of this kind of adds up over time. And so Numba can avoid all of that memory allocation because you are just writing a loop into an accumulator. We also will do things that I can show you actually on a different notebook here. Um, oops, not that one, uh, this one. <clears throat> so uh, this notebook showing that there's actually two things going on here. One, this is the stuff that Intel contributed, which is they call parallel accelerator. Uh, what it will do is if you, if you turn on parallel equals true, it will look for certain patterns of code that it knows how to multi-thread. Um, so for Ooh. example, uh -huh. uh, array op Array operations are, are very uh, parallel because you're, you're taking separate elements and combining them, and each element can be done independent of the other usually. So what Parallel Accelerator will do is look for this kind of a NumPy expression. It actually does a lot of things, but in this case, that's what's going on here. And say, oh, when you are doing this for large arrays, let's say like you, know, you have a million arrays here, or a million uh, values here, this is computing Gaussian, uh, uh, the Gaussian distribution basically. Um, what it will do is actually automatically convert this expression into a parallel for loop of sorts um, that will use multiple threads and therefore use all the cores in your machine. Um, I only have four cores and some of them are busy uh, running the webinar. So um, this isn't gonna go super fast, but it is uh, a very convenient way to be able to uh, get multi-threading in, in some cases without having to do a lot of work. Um, and that's another one of those things that we're, uh, uh, really interested in enabling is easy parallelism. Um, yeah, okay, my, my my CPU is hammered, so it's not. I'm not actually getting anything for the extra thread or not much of anything. Um, but that's this is the kind of stuff uh, that we're we're trying to enable. And one other thing I want to show off um, a more recent feature uh, is we're trying to figure out how to interoperate with um, some code in your in your in your application. You're not ever going to compile. It's just not necessary and not easy to do. Like, for example, the thing that draws the progress bar on your screen, like if you're using the progress bar um, package, uh, it doesn't need to be compiled. It's not the, the core bit of your code. But what happens if you're in an algorithm and you want to call out to the progress bar to tell people, hey, I, this is how far I am in the calculation? That would normally in Numba be impossible because we can't call Python objects. We're, we're in no Python land. Um, but what we added recently was the ability to jump back into object mode is what we call it, which is now I have <laughs> Python objects again, uh, inside of this function to do something that is not performance critical, like update the progress bar. Um, so here you can see this progress bar is actually being updated from inside of compiled code. We basically reacquire the gill, call back out to Python, say, hey, call this function on progress bar. And then when you're done, we go back into no Python mode again. Um, and that's, a, that's not a performance improvement, that's a quality of life improvement. And that's the kind of stuff that we're uh, trying to do more of um, these days. So I have a quick question from a user standpoint. If I just use like the sort of number way, I mean the NumPy way of creating a function versus mm -hmm. using it like the for loop and kind of the first example you had, Yep. Is there a huge performance difference? Like, there, is, there I... sometimes is. Um, so one thing that uh, what number will do is when you write an array expression, it will actually try to uh, uh, take that array expression and turn it into basically a custom u func, uh, universal function that NumPy has. Okay. Um, and so that will uh, the result of doing that is we will eliminate some of the temporary arrays. So you will get actually a perform. That's the two x on that two to two hundred x that mm -hmm. Anthony mentioned. Um, Usually, if you're doing pure NumPy calls, um, at most, Numba will speed you up like two or three x because we eliminate those temporaries. If you're if you can't do NumPy for some reason, um, like you need you have some kind of custom thing that write, requires writing the for loop, that's closer to the two hundred x end it. of the speed up. Um, so okay. it is still it is still beneficial. Um, a lot of times, where I think Numba shines is if you're saying to yourself, "Man, I wish NumPy had a U func that did blank," and it doesn't. Uh, Numba is the best way to go make that function real quick. <laughs> um, that's cool. And that's really where I think, if, for example, if, if you are just going to call the NumPy cosine 
function. Mm -hmm. Compiling that with number will get you nothing. We're both calling down to the same libm implementation of cosine. Uh, right. If you are doing a more complicated expression, that's where number will start to pull ahead of numpy. Is that, that when I'm, I'm starting to combine functions that require temporaries and numpy, number can make those temporaries go away. That's so cool. So going back to the parallelism thing mm -hmm. for uh, just a moment here, yep. do does that also enable emitting SIMD instructions for array expressions or how? Yes. How? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what are a, some of the tricks? I, I know we're not teaching a compiler class here, but no, but that's a good curious. that's a good point. And, <laughs> yeah, and 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 for people who may not be familiar with SIMD as a as a acronym, um, that's single instruction multiple data, and what it is is in this sort of blurring of high performance chips. Um, CPUs are starting to get uh, have been getting for some time now actually instructions that let you do the same math on many data elements at once. Sometimes two or four or six or eight even. Uh, data elements, you could do the same math operation. Uh, and that lets them uh, more efficiently use the chip for arithmetic, um, which is uh, really interesting. This kind of almost starts to make the CPU feel a little bit GPU-like. This is really how, why GPUs get so much performance, is they're doing extremely wide SIMD operations. Um, but we're getting that capability in CPUs now. And so if you're using a you know a, an Intel processor from the last two years, you probably have access to uh, instructions that can operate on 512 bits at once. So you could chop that up into uh, some number of 64-bit floats or 32-bit floats or that sort of thing. Um, and the cool part about LLVM is that it has the ability to look at a for loop and in some cases identify, oh, I could do that with SIMD instructions and we'll convert auto, what they call auto vectorization. We'll take this for loop you wrote that's just taking scalars out of an array and doing something and convert it into vector instructions. And that is, uh, that's an amazing uh, capability that's, I would say, not always 100% uh, going to work. It, it, it's not going to generate incorrect code, but it will sometimes look at a, a for loop and say, nope, I don't know what to do here, uh, especially if you have branches and things in it, um, and just leave it as a regular scalar for loop. Um, but this, this uh, notebook here uh, that's also in that binder link um, will talk you through sort of what's uh, required here. That in, for example, uh, SIMD instructions um, will change the order of operations slightly. Um, something that may be familiar to a lot of scientific computing people is that uh, floats aren't real numbers, is how I like to describe it. Um, <laughs> if I add four floating point numbers on my computer in a different order, normal math rules say those should give you always the same answer. On a computer, they don't. And that's because rounding will cause and will change the numbers slightly between each one of those adds. Um, and so uh, because compilers don't like to change, uh, don't like to surprise people who write numerical algorithms, I think is the best way to describe it, they will often not, they will be very hesitant to change the order of operations on floats unless you give them permission. And the way that you give them permission in most compilers and also in Numba is uh, there's a flag uh, doo -doo -doo down here. Nope. Uh, there it is, fast math. Um, so th this is a standard compiler option. Numba also has it, which basically says, hey, you're allowed to do things that might slightly change my floating point results because you're going to do things in a different order. But if it makes it faster, that's OK. And so uh, to get access to these uh, SIMD instructions, you frequently have to tag your function as fast math equals true, basically saying it's OK to do these things. Um, there are also subtle things that can happen. Um, uh, division in NumPy and Python work differently. <laughs> These are the kind of things that keep number developers awake at night. Um, in, in Python, if you divide by zero, you get an exception. In NumPy and C and every other numerical language, if you divide by zero, you get NAN, not a number. Um, and if you are compiling a function, we are constantly, in some sense, numbers wedged between these two worlds of, do we behave like Python or do we behave like NumPy and C and all of that? Um, and we've tried to thread that needle different ways through the history of Numba. Uh, and currently, what we will do in the JIT function is we will try to behave like Python, um, which is unfortunate for performance, but maybe surprises people less. <laughs> um, so you have to do other things that this notebook describes, like can tell Numba, actually, I want you to behave like NumPy when it comes to division by zero. Um, and that will ensure that when you do this for loop and you have like a division here, that like in this example, um, if they're normally Python, if there's a divide by zero, you basically have to check if this was going to be zero, and if it is, raise an exception. 
that mm -hmm. check and raise totally breaks SIMD instruction generation. So you have to actually say, no, 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 it's okay. Behave like NumPy, just give me the NAN if that turns out to be zero. <laughs> and then you will get your SIMD behavior. So um, these are things that unfortunately, um, it's hard for uh, Numba to make decisions for you. So what we try to do is in this example notebook here is to talk you through, this is also in the docs. Um, what do you have to think about if you're really trying to squeeze out all the performance you can out of your hardware? So in some sense, Numba has to be a mixture of helpful compiler tools and the kind of user education about how to get performance um, out of modern hardware. For, yeah, for their particular uh, situation. Well, that's really great, Stan. Uh, Carol, did you have any quick last questions? Or? No, I was just going to say thank you for putting these notebooks together because yeah, I think they're... it is really helpful for people to kind of try it out and see it on their own use cases. So, yeah, they're mm -hmm. really excellent. So, at this point, we're going to go into our roadmap discussion. So, these are places where folks who might be interested in contributing to Numba, either via funding for a particular future activities of Numba or contributing code or you know just helping out. Uh, these are the, where the project is going and uh, things that the project would like to do. And you know the more hands and eyes, the better. So mm -hmm. let's, uh, you've, got a, you've got a number of different uh, items on the, <laughs> on the roadmap here distributed temporarily, which is kind of cool. So sh short, medium, and long-term goals. So why don't we just go ahead and kind of go through those right now, Stan. So if you yeah. want to kick off the discussion. Here. Yeah, so I would say um, one thing for you will to be aware is that, yeah, the, we've recently, as of the start of 2019, put our roadmap into the docs. Um, we hadn't really <laughs> been super public about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so hopefully you have a better idea of what we're thinking about. And, and really the way to think about a roadmap is um, we spent the initial part of Numba's life just trying to figure out, could we generate fast code on many chips and actually have it be useful for numerical computing. And that was, it was just like, could we just achieve that base goal? Um, and I feel like we've done a lot there. And so now as number matures, we're kind of shifting gears a little bit into the, okay, how do we make this easier to use, easier to understand? Because Numba is doing a lot of stuff on your behalf. Um, there's nothing more terrifying as a uh, developer than not trusting your compiler or not knowing <laughs> what it's doing. <laughs> and so, um, minimizing surprise is is a is something where you know we generally is a goal. Um, documentation. There's also a uh, number we've we've changed what we consider best practices inside of Numba implementation-wise. Um, early Numba tended to go down to more of what I would call kind of like writing, Not it's not really writing assembly language. LVM has its own internal representation called LVM IR, which feels like a portable assembly language. Um, and early Numba was too quick mm -hmm. to reach for that. Newer Numba, we actually use our own compiler to compile ourselves, if that makes sense, more. And so more of Numba is actually written in kind of readable Python than it used to be. And there's a lot of old stuff that we need to go back and get rid of that old way of doing things and make it more readable, shorter, easier to debug. Um, so there's, that's kind of where we're going with that. Um, short term, really what we're focusing on is um, error messages and debugging. Debugging is a really hard problem when you start doing something like Numba because PD, you can't just fire up PDB um, because you're dealing with code, a mixture of interpreted code and compiled code. Uh, and so we've been trying to understand better how to do that. So Stuart actually implemented this amazing thing uh, that lets you actually fire up GDB from inside of your compiled function and connect into it and actually see like lines of code that you wrote and that sort of thing. So it's still GDB, which is a little bit uh, harder to use than PDB is. Um, but that that has been, that's that kind of feature that we're really looking for more uh, ideas around. Other things we're trying to figure out is um, profiling code. Uh, it's ironic that for a, a project that's about getting fast performance, once you convert your code into Numba, it's much harder to profile it because all your uh, Python profiling <laughs> tools just treat that, that Numba function as just an opaque black box. It'll still show up in the profiler, but once you pass into the no Python zone, you don't know what's happening anymore when you run, uh, you know, very C profile, line profiler, that sort of thing. So uh, an open question for us is actually how to profile a mixed program like this and present it to the user in a way that's that's understandable. Um, I love C profile, and actually I love line profiler especially. Um, but it's hard to figure out how to do that in a code that in an application that's mixed together. Um, so have you thought about in in that? area sort of tools like the Cython 
Cyvon has this tool where it'll dump out an HTML file that's highlighted with all the, you know, slow parts that are yeah. kind of statically analyzed. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, the, the the Cython annotation was a real inspiration for us. Uh, we yeah. added recently uh, an actual contributor actually helped sort of revive this capability in Numba to dump out kind of a highlighted thing. It's of limited use for us because for Cython, what they're basically showing you is how much of this function could I get rid of the Python for? Basically, it's right. uh, when I was talking about you know no Python mode. Cython, where whereas for Numba, it's like an all or nothing. For Cython, it's a, it's a gradient. And what they're showing you in that tool is basically, where are you on that gradient? Um, the, the thing that isn't showing you is how much time does that actually take at runtime? It's just saying, well, I didn't, this is, and, and because the, co the cost of using CPython calls is so high, you should, it's still useful because you should go find all those ones and, and get rid of them. You know, add more <laughs> type information, find ways to call into Python less. Um, for Numba, it's kind of that, the output of that tool is not as informative because it's sort of like, well, this whole function was compiled. Here are the types we inferred. That's sometimes useful for debugging because um, if you are using higher precision types than you intend, that can have a performance impact. Sure. Um, but what it's that runtime profiling that I think is a real interesting uh, thing we need to solve somehow. Um, and we have ideas, but we don't have a, a, a full solution currently. Um, yeah, another good. item. Oh, oh I was going to say it would be a good SciPy open space because. <laughs> You'd have a whole bunch of folks that probably could, you know, talk through some of those things. So. Yeah, and and this is something actually. It's not even necessarily just for us. I mean, you could imagine wanting to do this for things like stuff compiled with Cython or other tools. Right. Um, you know, uh, Sue has a has a project under the number repo, sort of experimental, that actually does basically statistical sampling of your application, including all the C calls as well as the Python calls. Um, and how do we combine that into something presentable to the user is still open. But um, people who have ideas about this, this is an amazing place to jump in because it doesn't necessarily require you to get super deep into the number code base. Mm -hmm. um, but it does require you to be able to sort of think about that sort of Python and compiled layer together. Right. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing short term that we're going to need to do uh, is uh, pay off what I would call some technical debt from design decisions that we made early in the project. Um, so so numbers core sort of data type that we really cared about were NumPy arrays. That's where all the numerical computing comes from. That's what we uh, that's our bread and butter. It also happens that NumPy arrays are really easy to uh, get rid of the Python bits, as I was talking about, because <laughs> you, you have some type information and you have a data pointer and yay, that's all you need. Um, when you start talking about containers that are very familiar to Python developers, but are all like a list, is effectively an expandable array of Python objects. That's all Python knows. That's not going to work in no Python mode because we have to get rid of all the Python objects to generate fast code. So uh, early number, we were trying to figure out what to do here. How do we deal with lists? Because people wanted to have lists. Um, and so one thing we did is that on your way into that no Python mode function, we will do something that, you know, unboxing, as I mentioned, we will actually go down that Python list, pull out all of the objects, and then unwrap all of those. So if you had a list of integers, we would turn that in memory into something that you might be familiar with from like C++, like an STL vector of integers. Um, that is expensive that, that, in time. It, you have to go through the whole list every single time to do that. So we were like, and, and even at the end, like what happens if I add an item to the list? We would have to go back and update the Python list at the end of the function to give you the illusion that that's what we were operating on the whole time. And so this is this internally we call this reflection. It's basically I take your list, I convert it to a form that's more uh, fast. I, I then let you modify it, and then I go back and update the Python list with what you did. Um, it's it's a uh, it cool. felt like at the time it was we were helping the user by transparently uh, letting them pass in a Python list and just just make it work. Um, in the long run, it actually has turned out to be a really bad idea. <laughs> it, that making that ref when you start talking about, for example, lists of lists of things of whatever, um, that reflection just gets out of control. It's it's both slow and very buggy. Um, so what we've been doing so recently, the next release of Numba, which uh, the release candidate should be next week, hopefully, um, will contain dictionary support, which has been a huge, huge request for years. So you will actually be able to make dictionaries in No Python mode. And use them. They work just like Python three seven dictionaries. We actually used a lot of their implementation for it. Um, and that that's outside of the with object context. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, that is actually a a typed dictionary that you can use freely in no Python mode. Okay. Um, nice. Using all of all of the uh, 
optimization obsession that CPython had on their dictionary. But what our dictionary is different <laughs> in that it is it is a typed dictionary. You have to say this is a dictionary of strings that map to integers or integers that map to floats or something like that. It's mm -hmm. it's a statically typed dictionary. Um, yeah. So we can actually generate much more efficient code. Cl um, closer to the C++ map. Yeah. In, in some yeah, ways. The, it's it's like a, the I guess C plus plus eleven has a hash table finally. Oh yeah yeah that's right long. sorry yeah. yeah 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 but it's like that. Um, yeah. So what we've done there with dictionary is we said okay reflection was a bad idea it's too surprising for the user we weren't actually helping them. Instead what we're doing is the number dictionary is a type that you can instantiate in Python. You basically say I want to take my dictionary and turn it into a number dictionary. You make that conversion once. We represent everything internally in a way that we can then pass to no Python mode efficiently, and that is what we use. So now that you are in control of the data conversion and there's no more reflection problem because we're literally updating the real thing. We're not, there's not a parallel universe of like your dictionary and the number dictionary. It's just the number dictionary right. that you can still use from Python. It's not gonna be quite as fast from the interpreter as a Python dictionary is because we have to behind the scenes kind of rewrap stuff up for you. Um, but it means that there's less surprise. And that's really, I think, where we're going is we need to. So we have to do that now, and we'll we'll do that with we'll release that with dictionaries. See how that works for people. We have to go back and do that again for list. We have to rewrite all of list to work this way. We have to rewrite all of set to work this way. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a that's going to be a short term task for us. When we're done, hopefully, there's just things make more sense <laughs> to people. Um, so that's that's another uh, uh, thing. Another one we have to go back um, is. Uh, we're at the point now where people are using Numba enough that they're starting to see the compile time question. Like, if you have a library with a ton of no, of, of Numba functions and you start up, um, every time one of those functions is called, we have to do the compilation because it's a just-in-time compiler. Um, but uh, you don't necessarily want to pay all of that warm-up cost um, every time you run your application, right. you would like us. So we have the ability currently to cache the results of compilation on disk in your home directory. Um, the problem is that that doesn't work for all functions. There are certain things you can do in Numba that make caching not work. We can't save the function. It's uh, there's a lot of technical reasons for it. So that's why caching isn't turned on by default. Um, we need to fix those problems so we can turn on caching by default, so that you will no longer the first time you run the program you'll see that compilation overhead and then it goes away that's a that's a thing that we're it's on our short term that we really need to uh, resolve um, and then we think that'll also make it easier for other projects to adopt Numba um, to do those sorts of things excellent so could you in the next just couple minutes here go over yep. the medium and uh, and long-term goals yeah so, so, well? so medium honestly the biggest thing is is number 1.0 um, we want to declare number 1.0 but we realize that that needs to be, um, we have to be committed to being a stable interface for people if we want to make that declaration. And so there is, again, some bits we need to do to be able to say that uh, confidently. And at that, at that point, we will say, okay, look, you should be able to depend on Numba to keep running your code the same way. Um, if we make any changes, it'll be in performance, not in results, basically. Um, and that's, that's gonna be a, a big thing. And then we can start to span out and maybe there's more kinds of Python that we can't compile that we want to be able to add. Um, longer term, uh, there's a lot of crazy chips coming down the pipeline. I mean, CPUs and <laughs> GPUs, we kind of have some of a handle on, but you've got TPUs, FPGAs. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's got, people are going crazy with, with all these sort of, in some sense, array optimizer kind of uh, chips. Um, we want to make it easier for people to write entirely new targets. So right now, extending number to add new functions is fairly straightforward. Um, new types is less straightforward, but still doable. If you say like, hey, I have new chip, I want to write a whole new target, we don't have a good way to do that currently. You have to kind of get really deep into the code base to add that. We need to make that easier. Yeah. Um, on, another interop thing that people are really asking about a lot is C++. Like Numba can call it to C very easily. If you want to call it to C++, like what you can do with Cython, that doesn't currently work. Um, it's a really hard problem because LVM is in some sense too low level to help us. We actually need to turn Clang into a JIT. Um, as it happens, the particle physicists have already done this. Um, nice. They have a, they have a, yeah. a JIT <laughs> version. I, that, that's my past life. I was a particle physicist and I was watching them do this to, to uh, Clang as I was leaving. Um, and it <laughs> worked. Um, but so we need to maybe integrate with that, figure out how to use Cling 
which is their version of interpreted Kling, Kling uh, from uh, from Numba. Um, and that's really where we start getting things that are getting really interesting is what other languages can Numba call out to? Could we start calling out to Julia or Rust or should we have some interaction with R? I mean, I don't know. That's Those are all things that, again, we would love feedback on how we should approach those sorts of questions. Yeah, excellent. These are all really sound like really great areas for people to jump in and help or jump in and help coordinate or fund. Uh, in particular, <clears throat> yeah. the, the new chips they, the, and the new languages sound like huge tasks that could yes, really use yes, a we, lot of a lot of help we both want, yeah we both want to know both yeah can you help and even if you can't what do you want right um <laughs> right what, what right. would be useful to you uh, that kind of feedback is really valuable as well even if we could look we can't maybe do it today yeah excellent so we've got time for a couple of user questions so we're going to go ahead and go through those so the first question comes from hamir who asks, there have been a lot of different array-like objects, e.g. TensorFlow and PyTorch, whereas Numba only sports NumPy. Are there plans to generalize the Numba code so that it can take other types of array objects with ease? Yeah, so um, Numba does technically support the buffer protocol. Uh, it doesn't get exercised very much, and so there are likely usability issues. Um, but if any of those objects, uh, I actually don't know if PyTorch arrays follow the buffer protocol, but if they do, um, that would be a natural way for us to integrate with them. So um, it's something we're definitely very interested in. Uh, but um, the way I, we have the ingredients already there. Honestly, if someone wanted to go pick that up and say, tell us, uh, look, I tried these things, this isn't working, that would be a great feedback for us. Um, on a related note, actually, um, there's no buffer protocol for the GPU. So uh, one thing that Numba added, we 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 uh, basically copied the array interface from NumPy, and we have a thing called the CUDA array interface attribute that you can put on a Python object that tells Numba, hey, this data is on the GPU. Here's how you get to it. Um, so CuPy has added that, um, and uh, uh, PyTorch I think had an open PR to add that. I don't know if it was merged. Um, so on the GPU side, we are interested also in being able to inter interoperate with people's arrays. Cool. Excellent. Okay, we've got another question from Andrew Smith, and he asks, how does Numba work well with third-party libraries such as Pandas and Keras, and also some debug best practices? Yeah, so so Numba, the short version is Numba basically doesn't work with a third-party library unless they have uh, done some work to make their stuff Numba compilable. Mm -hmm. um, so Numba doesn't go and compile stuff for you. It, re it requires you to opt in and say, hey, this is the thing you should compile. Um, so we provide, we ship with Numba the implementation of most of NumPy as a result of that. The nice part is you can write a, an entirely separate project that actually would compile other things. So this is, for example, uh, for Pandas, um, uh, this project HPAT that Intel is working on is basically a Pandas compiler that's built on top of NumPy or uh, Numba. Um, Keras, there's really, uh, there's not as much uh, utility there if you are, it depends on which way you think about it. If, if you want Numba to call out to Keras, that's not going to work. You, however, could use Numba to implement optimized operations that you called from Keras, if that makes sense. You can imagine, uh, we've had people talk about wanting to say, hey, I, I want to make a new layer for my neural network. Um, you could, since ultimately all you need to hand into Numba is a NumPy array or something that looks like a NumPy array, you can imagine right, implementing that layer for TensorFlow and Keras with Numba's help. Um, I believe someone people have done this with PyTorch. I actually don't know the details of that. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Yeah, let me, I think we're running short on time for questions, but maybe one or two more here. So uh, Juan asks, passing functions as arguments seems to have some performance issues. How do these fit yep. into the project roadmap? EG, yeah, so I would say, definition number, so. Yeah, uh, so this I think fits in a little bit into the, um, in the medium term, one of the things we need to look at is uh, what we call the dispatcher, which is basically the thing that decides which machine code to call when you enter a function from Python. And what he's what he's alluding to here is that um, you have the ability to pass in a function as an argument in Numba, which is very useful, but the dispatcher is pretty inefficient about figuring out which code to call when you have a function as an argument. It basically has to do too much work to say, oh, this function goes here. Um, so I would say that's on the medium term is to as we work on improvements to the dispatcher. So it's not a short-term thing, unfortunately. 
Okay. Well, I think we are out of time for questions. Maybe we can hang around afterwards a little for people who want to get their questions out. And so there's a lot of good ones. I'm really sorry about this, but uh, that's the way it goes. At this point, we are now ready for our world famous rant section, which where we each get 15 seconds to rant about whatever topic we want. Stan, it is your soapbox. Ah, uh, yes. So my rant is somewhat self-serving. Uh, it's that basically is this is my public service announcement to ask you to please don't put NumPy brain teasers in your applications. <laughs> and what I mean by that is the the people do this all the time. It's like this three line haiku that says, hey, I can solve my problem by combining four different num, NumPy functions in this crazy way that requires you that you have like a PhD in NumPy in order to understand what's happening. Uh, my favorite example is there was someone in our lab who uh, wrote a four lines of, uh, of NumPy to actually generate the vertices of a triangle mesh wrapped around a cylinder. So I take a cylinder, I want to triangulate it. He actually did this in four lines of, of NumPy, which is completely insane. Um, <laughs> there, it, it's just, I mean, the other great one is Jake Vanderplas has a, an example, jokingly, of doing the game of life in three lines of NumPy. Um, it, it takes you just forever to figure out what it means. So please don't do it. Write a for loop, use NumPy. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I've got a quick rant about documentation and um, documentation is software development. Um, it's so critical to a project success. And like Stan mentioned earlier, the docs for users, let users be more productive quickly, but the docs for developers make it so that you can really grow your project and get all these cool things that we talked about in the short term and medium term, long term into that project. So remember, uh, documentation is critical for software development. Thanks, Carol. For my rant today, Wikipedia defines music as an art form and cultural activity whose medium is sound organized in time. This definition is so broad that the next time someone says that something isn't music, they are probably wrong. <laughs> in fact, open source directions could be music to your ears. That's all the time that we have for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. You can find us on Twitter at Quantsite AI. If you're interested in funding open source projects, including Numba, you can find all of the project road roadmaps at Quantsite.com slash projects. Stan, where can people find you and Numba? So the best place to find Numba is our homepage at numba.pydata.org. Um, we also have a Twitter account, uh, at NumbaJIT. Apparently, you can't use a dot in a uh, Twitter handle. Otherwise, it would have literally been the decorator for Numba. So it's <laughs> Numba under, it is Numba underscore JIT. I was so sad. It was like, ah, I could have had a Twitter code pun. Anyway, um, yeah. And so we, po we post uh, project updates, uh, Numba tips, and uh, retweet interesting uses of Numba there. Excellent. Thank you so much. And link up with us again next episode for an unshackled discussion on Chainer. Thanks, everybody. Oh, the puns are bad. <laughs> Bye, everyone. And thank you, Stan. Yeah.